and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that just can't quite seem to figure out the concept of financial sustainability. And conveniently, at least as far as today's show is concerned, once upon a time, way back in the Dark Ages, the then-emerging television industry, and in some cases before it even went commercial, was facing a similar dilemma to what we are now facing here in internet land. And that is, would TV in the long run have a better shot at survival via some sort of advertising-based model, or some pay-as-you-watch sort of model? And, of course, as we all know, in the long run, it's been a little bit of both. And so, uh, history has a way of repeating itself, so I, I guess it's kind of timely that we take a look back at, well, at least one half of that equation. Today, let's take a look back at some of those early embryonic stabs at what we now know as pay-per-view. As we know it today, pay-per-view is something that's attached to cable TV, usually to watch some movie or sporting event, I use the term loosely, or... Spice. Well, we've more or less discussed that already. But the origins of pay-per-view actually go all the way back to the dawn of commercial television, usually as some extension of early cable, read Community Antenna TV. Be forewarned, as of this episode, there is no surviving footage of most of today's topics. So, let the slideshow begin. In 1931, a full decade before the first commercial TV broadcast, in the US at least, Zenith, under the impression that TV would ultimately take off, but probably wouldn't fare too well on an advertising-based business model, began work on a, as they put it, pay-as-you-look system for television. This was called phone vision. Zenith was so confident in this idea that they even went as far as to claim one of the first TV broadcasting licenses in the country, namely Chicago's W9XZV, which ran from 1939 to 1950, then became KS2XBS. But I digress. It took until 1947, but Zenith finally announced their new concept. What they had worked out by this point was that programming would be sent over the air, just as any other standard TV broadcast, but certain frequencies necessary to the stability of the transmission would be intentionally left out, the missing frequencies being reinstated via telephone line. It took until 1951, but phone vision was ultimately tested. 300 hand-picked households in the, wait for it, Chicago area, were equipped with a set-top box to test out phone vision, the only requirements being that they be willing to accept a $1 per program charge and to provide feedback to Zenith on their experiences. The experiment was a mixed bag. On the one hand, users were using phone vision on average nearly twice a week, despite the programming consisting of nothing but minimum two-year-old films. On the other hand, everyday interference from weather, passing trucks, and airplanes and stuff proved to be something of a hindrance, rendering the phone setup somewhat moot. Now, despite these results, Zenith was encouraged enough by this test that, in a rather bizarre bit of hubris, they manufactured some of their later 1951 model TVs with built-in phone vision decoders, under the assumption that their system would ultimately take off. In 1954, Zenith took another stab at phone vision, this time via Secaucus, New Jersey slash New York City independent station WOR, though the tests were 100% private. This time out, Zenith sent all necessary frequencies over the air. Having said that, here's where things get a bit speculative on my end. Though I found no confirmation, my guess is that Zenith was broadcasting all the necessary frequencies plus a few extra. Your necessary decoder box would then filter out the rogue frequencies in the broadcast, kind of like how on TV would do it 20 plus years later. 
Anyway, over the next several years, Zenith took the phone vision experiment to New Zealand and Australia, but with no real success. In 1962, Zenith took one last stab at phone vision, this time in Hartford, Connecticut, via RKO-owned independent station WHCT. By this point, Zenith had settled on a card-operated system. You'd get a card with a series of obscured codes, you'd enter the card into your decoder box, the decoder box would give you a five-digit code, then you'd punch in that code on your box, and your card would get punched, and you'd get billed by a visiting technician once a month. Given the setup, it's surprising that there were no confirmed cases of piracy with this edition of Phone Vision. Conversely, it has been reported that non-subscribers would just deal with the poor quality and attempt to watch scrambled pay TV over the air. In addition to that, Zenith was never quite able to conquer the fact that their frequency setup would not support color broadcasts. Anyway, between these two factors, this proved to be Phone Vision's ultimate undoing. The plug was pulled on the Hartford Phone Vision experiment in early 1969. In a rather amusing endnote, in 1970, the FCC approved national use of the phone vision system. Zenith then tried in fits and starts as late as 1986 to get phone vision off the ground, albeit by then as a standard pay-per-view service tied to existing cable TV systems. In its roughly 35 years of use, phone vision never turned a profit. In 1951, the first competitor to Phone Vision was announced. It was called Subscriber Vision by a company known as Skiatron. Skiatron's method of delivering pay TV was actually what cable TV as we now know it would eventually become, TV delivered via wire. Skiatron's decoder box was similar to Phone Vision's punch card model, but instead operated on an IBM punch card that lived in the decoder box. Every time you'd order something, another punch would go into the card, and every month you personally would insert a new card, sending off the old one with payment to Skiatron. In 1952, Skiatron announced that they were seeking the broadcast rights to the then-new operetta A Night in Venice to launch their new service, assuming the FCC granted the license they wanted. It never happened. However, in 1953, Skiatron did manage a run of unlicensed private after-hours tests via, strangely enough, WOR-TV. Remember that previous segment? Anyway, in 1954, Skiatron was bought out by Universal Studios' vice president, Matty Fox. With Skiatron in tow, Fox began work on acquiring the TV rights to the RKO Pictures catalog, as opposed to Universal, the deal was completed in July of 1955, though Fox granted regular TV rights to these films just to hedge his bets. Anyway, with the RKO catalog in tow, Fox continued to try and build up a solid programming package for Skiatron, including baseball games and boxing matches. In December of 1959, Matty Fox's rather famous knack for sweeping the company's financial troubles under the rug caught up with him. Specifically, the Securities and Exchange Commission suspended trade of Skiatron stock, officially, over a deceptive prospectus for potential investors, though there were apparently some other slippery dealings. Regardless, it was just as well, because the FCC never did grant Skiatron any commercial licenses. Skiatron folded shortly thereafter. In 1953, Paramount Pictures took a stab at a different form of pay TV. It was called Telemeter. Unlike previous attempts at pay TV, this service would be completely coin-operated, running on the same cash-and-carry principle as going to the movies. This service, like Skiatron, was delivered completely by wire, giving viewers a scrambled picture when not paid, and a clear picture when paid. The decoder boxes could pick up a total of three channels, all from Telemeter. Channel A acted as an audio-only Barker channel that aired ads and prices for upcoming shows, and channels B and C aired those programs, plus the odd, free-to-view, in-house public affairs program. 
The charges incurred were automatically written onto a piece of magnetic tape that was then checked once a month by a company technician who would then empty the coin box to see if the amount matched the grand total on the tape. You know, to keep everyone honest. The first test for telemeter occurred in Palm Springs, California, ostensibly over their existing community antenna system. For a reported fee of $1.25, after an initial setup fee of up to $450, you could watch movies being simulcast from a nearby local movie theater, or, if available, sporting events. This test began in some 70 homes on November 27, 1953. By the time the experiment ended on May 15, 1954, the subscriber rate had jumped to 148 homes. Whether or not Telemeter would have ever caught on is something of a moot point, as the Palm Springs experiment couldn't stem the tide of complaints from competing local movie theater owners, including a lawsuit from a local drive-in owner, and a certain amount of feet dragging from the FCC. In 1960, Telemeter was given a second chance at life thanks to a test run in the Etobicoke section of Toronto, Ontario. For this test, cable had to be run to, to the tune of, 14,000 area homes, whether they wanted it or not. After a slew of ads in local newspapers, Telemeter was able to scrounge together some 1,000 households willing to pay the $5 for the decoder box and installation in time to go into service on the evening of February 26, 1960. This initial broadcast began with a free airing of a host of talking heads touting the new system, alas the names have been lost to time, followed by a short travelogue called The Wonders of Ontario. After this, viewers were given the choice of watching either Journey to the Center of the Earth, starring Pat Boone, or The Nun's Story, starring Audrey Hepburn. Paid, of course. On January 5th, 1961, Telemeter hosted the first ever non-film or sport pay-per-view event, namely An Evening with Bob Newhart, which aired live. This proved to be something of an all-too-early peak for Telemeter, reaching an estimated 1,740 homes, a number only bested by a live taping of Carol Channing's one-woman show, Showgirls, six months later, with the draw somewhere in the low 2000s. At its peak, Telemeter achieved around 6,000 subscribers, which, amazingly, was enough to create such a run on Telemeter boxes that boxes were confiscated from not just abusive viewers, but from houses not spending at least 75 cents a week. The boxes, of course, were then given to new subscribers. This success, however, was rather short-lived. By the summer of 1964, due to money issues, Reed running at a $3 million loss, Telemeter largely dispensed with specialized programming in favor of just running movies. This combined with the novelty of the technology wearing off caused the subscribership to drop to around 2,000. The Telemeter saga ended for good on April 30th, 1965, with Paramount quietly pulling the plug. No one seemed to notice. In 1957, in the then-thriving oil town of Bartlesville, Oklahoma, population 28,000 at the time, a somewhat different sort of pay-per-view experiment took place. This was called Telemovies. Unlike Telemeter, this service was actually closer in spirit to that of current premium channels on cable TV. Read a flat monthly fee to watch a network, if you will. Also, unlike Telemeter, Telemovie held true to its name. No sports, no special events, just movies. However, around a dozen of these movies per month were first-run titles, broadcast straight from a film chain from a local movie theater. Telemovie launched at noon on September 3, 1957, with a roughly month-long free preview. For what it's worth, the initial broadcast consisted of several airings of The Pajama Game, starring Doris Day. Anyway, as of the paid launch in early October, Telemovie had some 300, or depending on your source, closer to 500, subscribers, each paying a flat rate of $9.50 per month, or $9.70 depending on your source. Unsurprisingly, with a price tag like that, there was little interest in Telemovie. 
Indeed, the subscribership only grew by a few dozen by the start of 1958. That February, the subscription rate was dropped to $4.95, or $4.50, or $3.50 depending on your source, which either way caused a spike to somewhere in the, again depending on your source, 800 to 1,000 subscriber range. Alongside this price cut, the service dropped to an allowed six movies per month, with additional features at 65 cents each. At the same time, one of the previously two telemovie channels stopped airing films entirely, switching over to an audio-only, all-Muzak format. Over on the other channel, broadcast hours were dropped to only two airings each evening. The telemovie experiment quietly concluded on June 5th, or 6th depending on your source, 1958, with each remaining subscriber, to the tune of 300, allegedly given a free pass to attend a movie at a local theater of their choosing. In a bit of oddball trivia, the following year a Bullerette, as it was known, offering a miniature bowling game for 10 cents a round, proved to be the cultural hit for Bartlesville that Telemovie just couldn't seem to provide. Today's final topic is more an addendum than anything else. In the 40s, jukeboxes were starting to become a regular thing in some bars and restaurants, so naturally the logical next step would be a TV set that you could watch for a fixed time at a fixed cost. These sets debuted in 1947, but never really caught on. Meanwhile, some upscale hotels allowed guests to rent TV sets by the day, but that proved to be more trouble than it was worth for the hotels, and it was just as well because the would-be barroom pay-as-you-look TVs were being installed in some hotels starting around 1950. These TVs actually managed a pretty long run, some as late as the 70s, but most hotels, as early as the early 50s, opted to just install a regular TV into your room and build in the cost to their standard room rates. Needless to say, the coin-operated sets were really more a fixture in seedy motels. Starting in the early 70s, pay-as-you-look TVs managed to take some hold in bus terminals and airports throughout America, amazingly lasting through the end of the century. Now, over in the UK, coin-operated TVs were surprisingly common, but strangely enough, in the home. Thing was, it wasn't so much a luxurious, exclusive thing, as we've discussed already, so much as it was their take on the rent-to-own method of purchasing furniture. Even more surprising, these existed as late as the late 2000s via the likes of Homebuy and the Granada Telebank. And that's it for today's archive. Join us next time when I start a really crappy indie rock band that sings songs only about obsolete TV stuff. Assuming such a thing doesn't already exist. And I certainly wouldn't put it past my generation. <laughs>